right, sounds good. Well, hey everyone, nice to see you. I'm Dap. I'm one of the Badger Dog co-founders and one of the devs on UBTC. So yeah, excited to talk to you guys about the protocol today. Um, there should be some interesting components to dig into um, that are relatively novel for liquidity forks and um, CDP protocols. And so I'll start with kind of a 10,000 foot view briefly um, to give people a little context. And then beyond that, I would refer you guys to Johnny Time's excellent video, intro video and a couple of the resources which I'll post. But to start, EBTC is a CDP protocol, you know, think single collateral die or liquidity where you have collateral and you mint a synthetic asset against that. Um, in those cases, they're US dollar stable coins. In our case, it's a synthetic Bitcoin. Um, so you can think of it in the same sense as being a, a stable coin that's intended to be pegged to an underlying asset via price feed. And the collateral is staked ETH. So we have this interest bearing collateral and no borrowing fees. There's no continuous interest. There's no um, initial fee like in liquidity. And the fee is instead taken as a percentage of your staking yield. That's, that's configurable over time. And the collateralization ratio is um, pretty tight because of the historical correlation between ETH and Bitcoin relative to um, ETH and dollars. So that's really the fundamental of the protocol. You deposit your ST ETH, you can take loans against it. Liquidations are fairly typical in being, though different from liquidity, they're fairly typical. There's a premium that's given to the liquidator as a reward that should help cover gas and ensure profitability of even the smallest CDP, which is you know, two SD ETH in size. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of interesting nuances to dig into with regards to say those mechanics of the zero interest fees, right? How the price feed works, it's pretty complex. Um, as you know, so those economic potential exploits, the price feed stuff and kind of the relatively unique accounting of sharing interest and sharing um, debt redistributions, if there eventually is bad debt, at some point it does get socialized. Um, so there's a lot of interesting stuff to dig into there. Um, as far as the code goes, I'll give kind of a 10,000 foot view there. We have a few entry points. Borrow operations is kind of where the users do their things, right? Opening positions, adjusting their positions, closing them. And this would be the main interest points for kind of users of the protocol. Funds, like this is kind of the honeypot of funds is in the active pool. This handles kind of your system level accounting for the STE and the total debt. You can also take STE flash loans from here. And the CDP manager is kind of where all the, most of the CDP related data structures are stored. And this is also where you'll do things like liquidations and redemptions, which I didn't touch on, which are very similar to liquidity and that you can take debt back to the protocol. It will honor it as if it were one Bitcoin, right? This is kind of a last um, resort peg stability mechanism that provides a hard floor and it'll provide a fee on that. So you can think of it as kind of a AMM for the collateral. And this means that there is a way to redeem other people's collateral starting from the lowest collateralization ratio, the riskiest position to the highest position. You have this risk of redemptions. When they're on, there are heavy fees apply. It does scale a lot. So it's like a really bad AMM trade. That's kind of the last ditch resort if it's depegged in the market. I think that touches on kind of the core economic mechanics, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, there's some more stuff in there, but yeah, I would dig more into Johnny Time's video for that. And I think I wanted to spend this time primarily touching on new stuff and some of the more interesting potential mm -hmm. areas for exploits that have been um, touched on in some of the, the previous reviews. Like it is a pretty complex code base. There's a lot going on. And so there is a lot of potential attack surface there, especially when you consider things like flash loans, like the zero interest borrowing aspect was a thing bugs have been found in before. That's notable. Kind of the new economic areas as well as new new code areas. And yeah, so, I just, uh, thank you for that. And I just want to say uh, that it's great to see such uh, detail and uh, aspect comments in a code that definitely uh, will help our community guide them in understanding of what they're looking currently at. Yeah, I appreciate the feedback there. As a dev myself, I can always appreciate those. You know, docs are great, but it's great if there's more documentation in the code itself, right? And so I like the notion of having as much as possible there, especially, you know, ether scan is a point where people uh, tend to look at code, so. Exactly, yeah. So uh, thank you for the introduction uh, that uh, 10,000 foot 
uh, I mean, 1,000 foot uh, overview. But if you could uh, right now uh, walk us through what actually right now would be in the boost uh, scope, uh, what you would like uh, people to focus on, uh, and what new has been introduced. Sure. So if we go in the boost scope, we have kind of the core system contracts, including the ones I mentioned, and it's kind of your usual suspects with regards to bugs, with Immunify's classification system um, that they've developed over time. Um, one key thing to note is that we do have some assumptions around those, such that you know we want realistic conditions in the protocol with regards to bugs if it's going to upgrade the status, right? Something that could, could exist, you know, when we end up with like extreme edge cases where it's like one way is lost over a hundred years, if there's a trillion CDPs, you know, that type of stuff, um, while a valid finding and great would be a medium. Like I think about it in real life, this is something that you would not pay out a critical bug bounty for, but you would be something that it's um, at that level. You know, thank you for looking into the, the code base and, you know, supporting the white hat community. So I think that's one thing to know, there are some kind of parameter gates that are to make it realistic to upgrade into the higher categories. Um, and so I think of it as a thing that would be an actual bug um, in, in production. And so, uh, Adrian, is there anything else you'd want me to touch on in terms of scope there? Uh, scope, uh, not necessary. I mean, uh, I think it's uh, quite clear. Uh, let's see if anyone in the audience has questions re uh, regarding the scope. Uh, please write that in the chat if you have anything. Let's give it like one or two minutes. Question to pop up. Currently, I see that there are no questions, so I think uh, we're fine to move forward. Uh, so uh, from the new scope uh, that uh, has been introduced and will be uh, in the boost itself, is there any particular uh, area that you would like uh, people to focus on? That you see yeah, that, sure, sure. Uh, that may be uh, potentially vulnerable or maybe took some greater amount of developers' time to actually produce uh, that code. That definitely exists. And there have been a number of changes introduced um, since the, the previous the Code Arena contest, right? So those are key areas to look into. And then I'll, in general, talk about some, some key areas which are you know sensitive and more complex. And so since the Code Arena contest, we have a few new high-level features. One is a pretty decently significant change to the price feed itself. Um, there's now a simplified higher level one in governance over the primary oracle. I think it's best if I show this um, visually. So at the highest level, you know, any lending CEP protocol needs accurate pricing and our best solution is currently oracles. And so this is at the oracle at a high level works like this, the protocol ask for a price when it's doing something. We have a primary and potentially a secondary oracle. And the high level logic is very simple here. It's like, it checks is the primary oracle valid according to its conditions, which might be like, it's not too out of date. You know, there wasn't some massive deviation that caused it to be invalid for a little bit. But if that's valid, you return that price. If not, you check the secondary oracle if it exists and return that price. And then finally, if there's no good price from the oracles, we return, we, we store and return the last known valid price instead of um, you know, reverting during in, in denial of service during that time. And so previously, <clears throat> the setup looked something like this. We had an immutable primary oracle, right? And it is combining two chain link feeds to ultimately get the ETH BTC price, um, ETH ST ETH price. SCETH BTC price, excuse me, by combining these two feeds. Um, and then it had kind of a state machine and still does to define what to do, you know, depending on how live and functional these oracles are. And then if they're sufficiently broken, if it deems them sufficiently broken, it can fall back to an optional fallback oracle that isn't defined in the protocol right now. And so this is how it worked going into the contest. Subsequently, this entire structure is now a primary oracle to the real oracle, which is this EBCC feed. So 
the system contracts used to ping this. They now ping this, and this kind of forwards the results of this. Um, it can be switched out by governance, and there can also be a secondary oracle at this level. We don't intend to use this fallback oracle, and we'll instead use this, right? And then, so this is kind of the, the setup in the new version, but there's an additional change because basically this feed chain link was deprecating, and we have some debates around using this feed versus treating STETH as one-to-one. -one. So in the new setup, it looks something like this. You combine the Bitcoin USD and ETH USD, you know, some of the biggest, most mature chain link feeds into an adapter, chain link adapter.sol, to get that ETH Bitcoin price. And then that is, you know, fed in in the same way to the price feed. And then in addition for the ST ETH, ETH rate, we start with a one-to-one -one feed. This was ultimately, I mean, I can go more into detail this async, but this was ultimately because the risk of kind of Oracle manipulation or malfunction was deemed higher than real DPEGs in the post-merge world as opposed to the past. Um, there was an incident in Arbitrum where this was the case, which caused some liquidations. However, we still retain the ability to switch to the market rate, to a hard-coded market rate um, between these two with currently undefined logic. And then again, this whole price feed thing goes into the EBTC feed mechanic. And so I think that was an important change to touch on in how the Oracle works. And after going to that, I know you guys may not have the full context of the system, but I thought I'd pause for, for any questions. Uh, I have a question. Uh, how uh, fast does the uh, Oracle update? And uh, how many uh, previous prices do you store? Uh, in terms of historical historical prices, just so to be able, for level? example, for yeah, on a high level, just uh, just just to be able to, for example, check the staleness uh, of the price and just to be able to see from the code if there are any uh, major deviances from uh, what historically been uh, have been posted. Sure. So there's a few things there. One is at our protocol level, we only store the last good known price. There isn't like a sequence of last good known prices. That are stored, um, though I do think that that is interesting, and that you know in the future that's something that could be implemented in, in an oracle change at these levels. Um, and so, as far as deviation, this is it's going to be based on the uh, chain link oracles. All of these feeds, including these feeds, have a 0 0.5 deviation threshold, and so you can kind of theoretical maximum of combining them to find the maximum deviation versus the chain link interpreted market rate. So let's say 1%, or if you had all three of these, you know, the ST the market rate in all three of these, it would be something more like 1.5%. Um, they all have heartbeats that are, I, I don't know off the top of my head, I think some of them are closer to two hours. I think the ST might be 24 hours as far as the update there. And for staleness and stuff like that, we do check if they are sufficiently stale. Um, I can't remember the concept off the top of my head, but I will follow up on that. And we also check if the data is malformed in a number of hard-coded ways. In this state, we also check if there are the last if the last two, like the current one and the previous one, are above a certain difference from each other, it's considered invalid, right? So that's only on the issue of like two reported prices, right? It's assuming like, hey, there could be one bad chain link price, but they'll probably fix it by the next round. And so if there's an update right there and there's like a normal one and a super deviated one it will consider that a failure and return the last good price from it. Um, note that it would, if there was a secondary oracle, which there isn't right now, it would say, okay, this one's broken, check the secondary oracle and it, and it could update from there. So does that, does that answer your questions? Yes, definitely, thank you for that. Uh, okay, uh, let's ask our audience, do you have any questions regarding how uh, a BTC oracle works? Uh, for people who are not able to see the screen for some technical issues, uh, this mirror board uh, and short explanations, uh, I believe, could be uh, made available later on. I hope it will be uh, also visible in the uh, recording that Mackenzie is doing right now. Yeah, I'm definitely happy to follow up async mm -hmm. with, with any of the stuff. You know, we'll all be in the mm -hmm. chat. Yeah, and uh, remember, uh, 
Tabs and other uh, other guys uh, from the uh, other other folks uh, from the EBTC will be available on the Discord. So if you will have any questions uh, during the post uh, about some uh, architecture, I think uh, they will be able to answer any any of your questions. Yeah, we'll have so a few more can... devs, thirty researchers in there. Um, should have yeah. effectively twenty four hour coverage. Yeah, so please bombard them with all the questions that you have. Uh, any question that will help you find any any vulnerabilities. But as we uh, don't have any uh, questions regarding uh, oracles, uh, we can move forward. Uh, is there any other area of the code apart uh, from the oracles that you would like to highlight uh, to the community? So yeah, definitely. Um, <clears throat> so I can get back into that. So yeah, one of those is the price feed. Another area is around rounding precision when we do things like redistributing, like splitting the yield or redistributing bad debt, which hopefully will never happen, but is a kind of theoretical thing that can happen. Um, one of the changes there to call out is we made a minimum. There used to be no minimum debt in the CDP. There's a minimum collateral of two STETH, um, but there was no minimum debt. We made it a very small 1,000 way just to avoid things Weird cases, if you have like one, two, three, or way units of debt, you know, EBTC is a 18 decimal token as usual on Ethereum. So this is, you know, vastly less than one Satoshi of Bitcoin um, for context. But I think the accounting um, of these two is probably the most complex area there. And so I'm happy to dig into that a little bit more. So if we get into the code here, before any user-facing operation, redemption, liquidation, any of that stuff, we synchronize some pending state, which kind of starts in either sync accounting or sync global accounting. And so if I dig into that, with STETH, so it's like we can't hook into STETH when there are rebases. So we have to react to rebases, right? So we check, it's like, hey, did STETH kind of the rebase index, you know, increase since the last time someone interacted with the system if yes then we kind of update our cash value to that and we process that yield split from that an interesting thing to note here is that if no one updates the system from rebases they can be kind of missed right let's say there's three positive rebases and then a slash back to the original value and the system what no one touched the system during that time it wouldn't see those it'd be like oh no things are the same also to note there is that when the, if there's a slash, like there is no yield split on that, right? It's only about increases though, if there were further increases from that slash point, it would um, be taken as a split. And so how this works, once we sync the index, we have a notion. So there's a few notions here. One is the notion of stakes. So this is kind of like your proportion in the system kind of like vault shares, right? Like you're issued shares based on your percentage when you enter and there's a total stakes. That's the sum of that. And so we calculate like who should get what from there. And so what happens there is when the feeds are taken, there's ultimately a few things, which I'll touch on as variables. There's accumulator variables. So it's like there's these indexes, right? So we ultimately want to know how many fees you get or are taken, depending on your perspective, per unit staked. This is ultimately what this is driving on to. So there's a cash value of that. Maybe it's 1.1. Maybe there's a big rebase and it becomes 1.2. And so this is ultimately what calculates that incrementing index. And then when the CDPs themselves update, they have their own cash value um, at the CDP level. And so that will update to the global value. And this will determine how much they kind of owe from that, and it'll be updated in that time. Though it's processed at a global level here. Another thing to note here is we handle rounding during this fee taken process. You, know, you see there's a couple of division symbols here, which means there can be precision loss. In this case, when we're calculating the fees, we have the staking reward split divided by max staking reward. This would round in favor of the users, as in the protocol would get less than it should based on the percentage, based on the way loss here. And then when we calculate the fee taken, right? So there's like the per unit stake, we're doing a division, but there's also the total amount. And the total amount 
is probably higher than that, unless there's a very clean division. And so there's going to be that modulo remainder. And that remainder is stored in this value, this error. And then the next time there's this, this happens, process happens, this error is added to the current setup, to the, to the next one, right? And so this is how we track and maintain precision at this level, at the global level, right? When we divide down from the total to the per unit staked. Hmm. That's very so, interesting. Um, is this uh, described anywhere in the documentation how that works exactly in more detail? Or the code comments uh, are, are the only documentation that can lead uh, security researchers into better understanding of how the uh, fees work here? Yeah, no, I think we could use better documentation of this. There's, I did a report for another project building on us of how to recreate this pending state um, in a subgraph. And I think we should improve that into a more specific specification of this um, tell people, because I'd argue this is the most the most confusing part. And so I think that can be our priority to improve. OK, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, anything in particular in this uh, logic that you may fear that uh, may come up in terms of any bugs? Or are there any types of bugs that you fear the, mo uh, the most, the kind of bugs that keep you at the night uh, in this code section? That, that you think that may happen? Yeah, so I think, you know, there've been a number of bugs found with, that's what caused us to make sure that we sync the accounting state and the pending state before every operation. So when an operation is called involving a CDP, it is synchronized in the beginning of every operation, the global accounting state is synchronized. So any sort of situation where those get out of sync or aren't processed correctly is definitely of concern. Um, the rounding error here is should be handled at the global level, but at the CDP level, and this is this is known that we don't handle it when we're um, you know the the CDP then has its unit staked taken and it'll have another division symbol there, so it can lose one way of precision at that level. This is known, so it's kind of like the total collateral versus the individual, the sum of the individual collateral will and can deviate. Um, so there'll be a little bit of kind of unclaimed collateral in the system but you know this is in the order of you know ways over decades type of territory um, but it is due to ultimately not you know tracking and keeping that rounding error at the cdp level that we do at the global level another thing is about st rebasing right we've had issues found with regards to extreme slashing events extreme increases Mm -hmm. um, and how it behaves in regard to this, especially with slashing, and especially slashing below 2018. Like if it were really slashed that hard, I think that's a really interesting area to to explore with regards to that. Okay, fantastic. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, okay, uh, feel free to jump to another uh, code that you would like to go over. Uh, and yeah, please continue. So I'd also like to highlight on the same subject is there's this debt redistribution concept where in liquidations, you know, there is a premium and we ensure that premium lasts forever. So it's like, let's say a CDP is at 110%. The liquidator, it crosses that threshold, the liquidator gets that 10% premium. And that scales down. If it's at 107, they get 7%. If it's at 103, they get 3%. And at this point, you're still not generating any bad debt, right? Because 100% of the collateral, 100% um, of the debt is returned for 100% of the collateral. But once we go below 103, we keep the 3% premium to ensure that people still want to efficiently liquidate things that have gone bad, right? Historically, the ST price, the BTC price doesn't change this fast, but it could, right? Let's say if you had a 10% tick down, then you would have, um, everything went from 110 to 100%. And so if everyone liquidates here, and gets the 3% premium, you're only, you're returning 100% of the debt for 97% of the collateral. And so there's bad debt generated. And this debt has to go somewhere. And what, how it works is it's socialized amongst everybody who is remaining in the system. And this has the same process with the index, with the per unit stake. Um, and so, you know, ish, rounding issues here of concern, ways to exploit this or like intentionally self-liquidate to generate bad debt for others 
are of concern um, in that area. And again, this is this is an extreme scenario, but it's something that is designed to happen and handle in those in those those cases. So I think that's an area of interest. Okay, amazing. Uh, uh, people in the audience and the people who later will be uh, watching the recording of that, please take notes of that, of everything that Dabs is saying, and let that guide you into finding that uh, critical bug. Okay, uh, Dabs, please continue. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to highlight from the code perspective? Yeah, so in the new feature, we also have from a finding a TWAP on total debt as it refers to redemptions. And so for a little context, with redemptions, the fee is based on like how what proportion of the system is being redeemed. Right? So if you redeem a little bit, the fee scales a little bit off the base. Let's say the base is 1%, it kind of exponentially scales up and then decays over time. And this whole thing is designed to make redemptions kind of calm down, like make them unprofitable as quickly as possible, do some redeeming, restore confidence in the, have the market restore confidence in the protocol, and do the little redemption possible to achieve that hard peg floor and kind of get, put, put the brakes on it. And so with that exponential scaling, a key part of that equation is how much of the proportion of the system has been redeemed within a time frame. And so that's great, that's designed. But when we introduced flash loans, um, you now have a way to, or really it wasn't we introduced, like you just can do this, you can, this is true in general. Um, you can flash deposit, a huge deposit, generate EBTC debt, and now the system debt is maybe vastly higher. And so if you redeem in that same block, then you can, it'll scale way less, right? And so the, the fear here is that it can become more like a constant sum AMM, right? Where the fee stays the same, and of course, in a constant sum AMN, there's a certain equation point where it like you just kind of eat everything out of the system, right? Eat all the collateral out and then return all the debt. And that's obviously not the intended behavior. And so we introduced a TWAP on the total debt such that it doesn't use the spot value. It kind of lags the value of it. And this is designed to prevent what I shared there. And so the TWAP is in active pool. Um, ultimately, every time the system debt is increased or decreased, um, the TWAP value is updated. One thing to call out here is because the TWAP is so sensitive, we really wanted to avoid um, issues with it because it's kind of a, a bonus feature. Like we want it to gracefully degrade back to the original functionality if something goes wrong in there. Like we really don't want it to revert because if it reverted, it would cause like permanent denial of service here, right? And so mm -hmm. basically we put that whole thing in a try catch and if it ever fails, we just disable the TWAP and gracefully continue and then it no longer exists, right? But when the TWAP is used um, here in redeem collateral and CP manager, not the inner function, the outer function, internal function, we choose the debt at start as a key factor for determining the fee. And if the TWAP is functional, we take the minimum value of the TWAP at the start and the spot value, right? So it always goes in favor of the protocol. So this can lead to higher fees than we may have intended at some time. And that's considered okay um, because ultimately we don't want redemptions to be happening and we intend to help mitigate redemp um, do peg stability in other ways to avoid this point. But that's um, kind of a mechanic to prevent those flash loans from causing that fee to artificially scale down. And then, yeah, when you uh, have these. Uh, how uh, fast uh, TWAP uh, updates itself? What is the time time window? Sure, so it's um, seven days maximum. It keeps values mm -hmm. from the last seven days. And yeah, I'd have to follow up with you on that for more of the details, but I can post that in the, uh, the channel afterwards. Okay. Okay, thank you. And so I think those are the main things. I mean, we do have every PR. You, know, you can notice there's a pretty juicy list of PRs here since the um, updates, right? This was the stuff that's that's been changed. And so it's good to, to dig into these. There have been some other things like um, 
the last good price was stored on the price feed and the EBTC feed. If you remember this, instead we just store it on here and read it here. That's one change that happened since the last time. Um, also, a couple optimizations like turning a variable to uint128, removing this, I might call out. But yeah, first of all, I'll pause there. So we've got the hour, right? Mm -hmm. So let me see if there's any any questions. No, uh, so far I haven't seen any questions. Um, let's see if any if anybody has anything. Uh, any questions in the chat? But in general, I would use this kind of PR here. We didn't merge this down mm -hmm. just to sh show the diff of the protocol since the last main can be you know explored in detail. And the PRs tend to have pretty good descriptions of what they're changing and why. Um, so you can find those. They'll sometimes have links to, say, the Code Arena report, which is a good, a good read to digging into the type of issues that uh, people are finding. Yeah, that's uh, definitely going to be helpful. Uh, people, please take a note. And if you could also send a link to that PR in, and send it in the chat, uh, that would be great. But uh, moving on, uh, is there uh, anything else that we'd like to highlight uh, from the code level before we move to other questions? Sure, at the code level, one thing that I would, or an interesting bug that happened in the past was something called the whale sniper, which is a consequence of the recovery mode that's um, kind of enhanced in its potential profitability by the lack of fees on borrowing. And so how this works is in some level, let's say you have people like, so there's a recovery mode concept. Normally, everyone's liquidatable at 110%. But if the whole system goes down to 125% average, then that jumps up to 125% liquidatable. It's kind of an emergency measure at that point. And so you have this notion of a, a threshold, like a binary threshold. Um, and so like if you can kind of get the system down to like that border and maybe like combine that with a chain link update in the negative direction, like you can kind of make people liquidatable that shouldn't be. And then you get a 10% premium on that. So that's what we call the whale sniper attack. Um, and one of the mitigations to that was introducing this notion of a grace period. So when recovery mode is entered, they don't immediately become liquidatable. Instead, there's a 15 minute grace period before the kind of rules change on liquidation. And this was deemed to be fast enough with regards to Oracle speed and update. So its it, safety was improved. It gives people a chance to, in an automated way, adapt their positions before that the new rules come into effect. Um, we debated stuff like the kind of gradual ramp up of what's liquidatable, but you know, stayed away from that for complexity reasons. But I think that was a really interesting bug. Um, that was kind of an economic consequence that we hadn't considered. Yeah, that's definitely interesting. And uh, this bug, when was found? And in which portion uh, of the code? Yeah, so this was part of the Spearbit audit. Um, yeah, that was that was a while ago. So the number of changes since then, but this was kind of one mm -hmm. of the the key change, the, the key findings from there. Um, and for as far as what part of the code is, huh, what does it touch? It touches liquidations, and it touches the recovery mode kind of switching logic. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so we introduced the whole new grace period mechanic. Yeah. Yeah. And in this sub, I'm saying in the subject of interesting bugs. Uh, what else? Uh, what other interesting bug? Uh, your team have received that made you uh, guys scratch your heads and thinking, oh my God, we haven't considered this. Yeah, so I think those those categories of economic exploits related to that were a big one. Another thing is the fact that um, with no fees, now there are gas costs to consider. It's like you can kind of enter and exit positions like at will. So you can do stuff like avoid the yield split, right? Like if you can front run the rebase, you can get out, it happens, 
and come back in. And so you can avoid it personally. It doesn't affect anyone else in the system, but this was deemed to be to not make sense from a profitability standpoint um, for any reasonable scale, but it's something that was interesting, right? And so the mm -hmm. zero fees, the ability to kind of like front run combined with something else to get out and get back into position is an interesting area to consider there um, as opposed to liquidity stuff. Okay, and uh, anything else uh, that you can share? So I think you know the price feed itself has been mm -hmm. an interesting source of bugs because it is pretty complex. You have this kind of state machine logic of switching between different states. And for example, there's one of the cases there where you can have the same, you can return two different prices in the same block. I thought this one was interesting. Um, it's since been mitigated, but you know that price feed is is pretty complex and could have additional issues there. And that's you know one of the reasons we introduced the primary oracle governance, despite the fact that it's been you know tested pretty well at this point. I would definitely <laughs> rewrite that as something simpler, um, <laughs> especially when you consider changing oracles. It's it's kind of a tin foil thing inherited from liquidity about the permanent oracle, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean. Uh, anything that touches uh, pricing, uh, uh, especially in a type of the protocol that EBTC is, uh, prices are uh, really important and uh, keeping them uh, consistent. So even is the slightest uh, possible modification of a, of a price or even when that price will be uh, given to a system uh, can have uh, some consequences, uh, more critical or, and, or even less critical, but still. Uh, did the uh, pricing mechanism itself, uh, was that uh, the most complex uh, thing uh, from a development standpoint? Or uh, have been there uh, anything else that you have found uh, way more difficult to uh, develop and test? I'd say the most complex thing is the yield split accounting. Um... And the yeah the debt redistribution accounting, which you know a lot of the stuff is largely inherited liquidity, but it's changed enough that it became complex. So I would say the yield splitting is the most complex area that's new that probably gave us the most trouble. And a lot of this came down to <clears throat> just ex just avoiding as much pending state as possible, not trying to get efficient and sync the global pending state before each operation. So there's there could definitely be something in that logic. Okay. Uh, what, uh, I mean, you already have shared uh, lots of educational uh, resources on the subject of, uh, of your protocol. Uh, are there any particular ones that you would like to highlight that are the potentially the most useful uh, for people to better understand your project and to better understand the security consideration that your team have uh, have taken? Yeah, so I would highlight a few things in particular there. The way I would approach it is first, watch Johnny Time's video. Second, watch the Code Arena prep video. And then third, look at the um, the cheat sheet, which kind of goes into a lot of the exploits and considerations around that. I would also check the invariance file, which is also in the, in the bounty, but you know, I'll post all this stuff in the chat as well afterwards. Um, to give a hint of some of the properties that we intend to be true within the system. Yeah, especially the uh, the last part, uh, checking the invariants. Uh, uh, this is uh, always an interesting thing for me to uh, to look at and see what kind kind of invariants uh, uh, there should be, and that always gives me some idea uh, uh, what areas of the code uh, I should be looking just to see if I can break any of those invariants. It's great that you're sharing all of that. Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, I definitely went uh, and finished all my questions. Uh, thank you for uh, answering uh, uh, answering to them uh, so, uh, so detailed. But uh, is there uh, anything that you uh, yourself want to highlight uh, again that wasn't ready uh, uh, by you? And in the meantime, uh, um, uh, people in the chat, uh, please ask any questions uh, that you like uh, Dabs to answer. 
Yeah, I think as far as things to highlight, that's what comes to mind right now. Um, definitely we'll, we'll follow up async with more stuff. One of those things is kind of a, a spec of the accounting and then the uh, proposed resource order to look at things in, the recommended order. Okay, amazing. Uh, I think uh, we're fine uh, uh, with the call. Uh, yeah, uh, Mackenzie has uh, his, uh, sadly, his microphone uh, doesn't work. Uh, I'm gonna uh, make the final remarks. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dabs, for the overview uh, and for asking all the questions. That was uh, really uh, detailed, and uh, at least I, myself, I enjoyed uh, uh, hearing what you have to say. But uh, for people uh, interested in Boost and hunting on Boost, uh, please remember this Boost is live since this morning. Uh, and the boost is live. Please uh, submit any bugs uh, that you find. Uh, all the resources uh, are already in the uh, post BPP page. Uh, plus, uh, there will definitely be shared uh, in the Discord uh, channel itself. If you have any questions, uh, uh, people from uh, EBTC uh, are available here. Uh, there, uh, they will be more than happy to help you find bugs uh, in their code. So don't be shy about that. Ask questions. Uh, everyone here is to help you, uh, to help you find bugs, and for uh, EBTC uh, become uh, way safer, safer because that's why uh, uh, all of us are meeting here. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. Looks like we have um, one from Teleport here in the chat. Yes. Um, so okay, so if the MCR. 110%, that's minimum collateralization ratio. Yes, the, the CCR, which is the critical collateralization ratio, is 125%. That's kind of the threshold to enter recovery mode. That's why it's called critical. Um, does that mean that collateral doesn't have an infinite amount? I'm not sure what you mean by that exactly. Um, if the recovery mode is triggered, does the system revert it back to MCR? So it's like when the recovery mode is triggered, the MCR effectively goes to 125% until the whole system is above that 125% threshold. So once people get liquidated um, or up, top up their positions or get redeemed, then the whole system goes above that 125% threshold and the MCR goes back to 110. So it's kind of like this emergency thing where it's like, okay, the whole system is getting too degen, right? <laughs> we can only support so, many, so much degen leverage in the system compared to people who are borrowing at kind of a more um, safe, safe area. So this is a way to create even more safety in um, extreme scenarios. And that's what this and debt redistribution are about. They're things that there's a very good chance will never happen, right? Because that's kind of the intent is there's kind of just the, the, the ability for them to happen um, should be able to prevent people from wanting it to happen. Like they should fear those things happening, right? And manage themselves accordingly. Okay, are there any other questions? And teleport, please uh, let us know if that answer was satisfying to you. Okay, let's give it a minute, but I think uh... As we don't have any more questions, uh, we still can wrap this up. Uh, we will hang around in the Discord chat after the uh, technical walkthrough ends. Uh, so please ask in the uh, EBTC Boost Discord channel. And yeah, thank you again for uh, everyone here uh, for participation. Thank you, especially to you, Dabs, uh, for answering all the difficult questions. And yeah. To everyone listening and later watching on YouTube, happy hunting. Yeah, thanks everyone. Looking forward to uh, jamming on the code with you guys. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.